again and again, we are faced with the enemy of explainable AI, multi-collinearity. Highly correlated features can wreak havoc on your model interpretations. To overcome this, we could rely on good feature selection, but there are still cases when a feature, although highly correlated, will provide some unique information leading to a more accurate model. So we need a method that can provide clear interpretations even with multicollinearity. Thankfully, we can rely on ALEs. Hi, I'm Connor and welcome to ADO. So ALEs are a global interpretation method. They can provide similar information to PDPs. That is, they show us trends captured by the model. The important difference is that ALEs identifies these trends in a way that is robust to multicollinearity. In this video, I'm going to give you the intuition for how ALEs are created. Then I'll define the algorithm more formally. Finally, we'll apply ALEs using the Alevi explained Python package. You can find all this code using the link in the description. We will use the Abalone dataset to understand how ALEs work. Abalone are a shellfish delicacy. We want to predict the number of rings in their shell using features like shell weight and shuck weight, which is the weight of the meat. Here, we have the correlation heat map for all the numerical features in the dataset. You can see that we are dealing with some highly correlated features. Let's take a closer look at two of these features, shell weight and shuck weight. We can see why the two features had a correlation value of 0.9. Now consider the red instance. It has a shell weight of 0.2 and instances like this will have a shuck weight of roughly between 0.2 and 0.5. Yet PDPs would sample the entire range of shuck weight and permutation feature importance would randomly shuffle them regardless of the value for shell weight. In other words, using these methods, we will get unlikely or even impossible feature pairs. The key to this problem is the range. Correlations can only be calculated using the entire range of both features. If we only look at the instances within a small interval, then the correlation is meaningless. Here we have created an interval around the red instance by only considering instances with shell weight between 1.5 and 2.5. The plot on the right shows that in this interval, the correlation is not as obvious. A smaller interval would make it even less obvious. This is the idea that ALEs are based on. To avoid the correlation, we can determine the effect of shell weight within this interval. To do this, we create two samples from every instance in the interval. They are created by replacing their shell weight value with the minimum and maximum shell weight values in the interval. All the other feature values remain the same. The next step is to get the black box model prediction for both samples in the sample pair. We then subtract the prediction for the first sample from the second. We do this for all sample pairs and calculate the average. This gives us an estimate of the effect on the prediction due to the change in shell weight within this interval. Importantly, correlation with shuck weight will not skew this estimate. Okay, so this gives us the effect within a certain interval. To get the overall trend, we must do this for all consecutive intervals in the features range and add the individual effects. Every time we move to a new interval, we add the effect to the accumulated effect and plot a point. Doing this will give us the ALE for shell weight. We can now see where the name comes from. We are accumulating the feature effects within local intervals. Another way to look at ALEs is they are similar to integration or at least a Riemann sum that approximates an integral. The local effects are the rate of change or derivative of the function. By accumulating the effects, we find the black box model curve. The smaller our intervals, the closer we are to the true curve. Unfortunately for ALEs, we cannot make the intervals infinitely small. So there is a mathematical formula for an ALE, but I'll save you from it this time. It's still worth going through a more formal algorithm. So there's no confusion with how the plots are created. We find the ALE for a given feature X using these steps. 
Step one, we initialize the ALE. We set the accumulated local effect or the feature X to zero. Step two, we define the intervals. We split the range of feature X into K interval values and let XI min and XI max denote the minimum and maximum values of the ith interval respectively. Step three is to calculate the local effects for each interval. This is the process we spoke about using the orange and green dots. For each interval, we get the feature pairs by replacing the value of feature X with its maximum and minimum values, and then calculate the effect, which is the average change in the prediction. Step four, we accumulate the effects. The ALE value for the maximum value in each interval is equal to the ALE value for the minimum value in the interval plus the effect for that interval. Step five, we repeat steps three and four for all intervals we defined in step two. Step six is that we combine all the feature values and ALE values into a data set. Step seven, the values are typically centered to provide a clearer interpretation of the effect on the model's prediction. This is done by subtracting the average ALE value across the entire data set for each individual ALE value. And finally, we can plot the ALE if we want. Different implementations may have slight variations on this algorithm. For example, for step two, we will see that the Alevi implementation will define the interval so that a minimum number of features will be included in each interval. It's also possible to define them using a constant width for each interval. Okay, so hopefully this theory will become more obvious when we put it into practice. Let's jump to the notebook. If you're interested in this type of content, then make sure to sign up to my newsletter in the description. You'll get free access to an explainable AI course with shifting public sentiment and movements to regulate AI like the EU AI Act, factors in machine learning like interpretability, safety, fairness, and transparency will become more important in the future. The course gives you the tools to help stay ahead of this trend. We're working in the ALE notebook in the model agnostic folder. As mentioned, we'll be applying ALEs using the Alevi package. It provides a bunch of XAI methods. For now, we are interested in the ALE and plot ALE function. We are applying the method to the Avalone dataset mentioned at the start. So we load our dataset and select the target variable. We also do some feature engineering. Firstly, we exclude diameter and whole weight from the feature list. This is because we saw that they had a correlation of one with the other features. Finally, we create one hot encodings for the sex feature. Yeah, you can see a snapshot of the final feature set. We use this to train a model. Notice that when training the model, we convert the feature matrix to a NumPy array. This is to avoid a warning message when creating ALEs. To create ALE plots, we start by creating an ALE object. To do this, we pass in our model's prediction function, our feature names, and target variable. We use this object to create explanations for our X feature matrix. The explain function requires that the matrix is a NumPy array. To plot ALEs, we pass the explanations and the features we want to display to the plot ALE function. Using array positions of 0, 1, and 2 means we display the ALEs for the first three features. There are some conclusions we can make from the plot. The effect of length and height on the predicted number of rings is lower when compared to shock weight. The downward sloping line for shock weight indicates that the predicted number of rings tends to decrease as shock weight increases. We can also interpret individual points on the plot, but 
we must understand how the plots have been centered. The ALEs have been centered on zero. This is done by subtracting the average of the uncentered accumulated local effects from each uncentered accumulated local effect. Finding the average of the ALE requires us to first sum the accumulated local effects at each point in the ALE. The result is that each point on the ALE will give the effect of the corresponding feature value when compared to the average effect of that feature, or more simply, the effect when compared to the average prediction. So, looking at the plot or shock weight, we can make conclusions like a shock weight of zero will increase the predicted number of rings by six compared to the average prediction, or a shock weight of zero will increase the prediction by 12 when compared to a shock weight of 1.4. Okay. Let's see what else we can do with the Alibi package. If features have similar values, it may be useful to plot their ALEs on the same axis. We do this for the three weight features. It is now easy to compare the effects of these features. Notice that shock weight and shell weight have significant effects on the prediction. However, they are in the opposite direction. This is interesting. The features are highly correlated, yet they have a different relationship with the predictions. This is due to an interaction between the two features, something we could explore using another model agnostic method, like Friedman's H statistic. You may also notice that we have variable interval lengths. This has to do with the way the package selects intervals. By default, it will select intervals so that at least four instances are included. This is why we see a relatively large distance between the second last and last points in the ALEs. Our dataset becomes sparse for these weight values, and we need larger intervals to capture at least four instances. In this code, we create the same chart with one key difference. We have changed the minimum number of instances in an interval to 50. We do this using the min bin points parameter. You can see the result is a smoother ALE with larger intervals. This min bin points introduces a trade-off when creating ALEs. As we decrease its values, we decrease the size of the intervals. This will bring us closer to the true shape of the curve. However, we are faced with the issue of smaller sample sizes to estimate the effects within these intervals. In general, due to this uncertainty, we should focus on the overall trend instead of changes from interval to interval. Another consideration is that, as we have seen, the interpretation of the ALE is clear, but it is complicated to explain how we get to that interpretation, at least when compared to how PDPs are created. So, it is useful to use both methods. If their results agree, then you can always present the PDP. This can save you the headache of explaining what an average accumulated local effect is. If you're interested in learning more about PDPs, then check out this video. Otherwise, check out this one, which is the one YouTube thinks you'll enjoy the most. And remember, you can get my XAI course for free with the link in the description.